All right, hello everybody. We're in unit nine of your bio workbook, page 41, upstream process and cell growth. As we just learned, production sales have to have the quote unquote right stuff to make the product in high yield. Scientists in research and development labs select such cell types and characterize them carefully. Then they make what are called cell banks. These are collections of many little vials of these cells that are maintained in negative 70 degrees Celsius freezers or liquid nitrogen tanks. Liquid nitrogen is often used to help store cells. Cell banks kept at production facilities are a major company asset because they serve as the source for all large-scale cultures that are grown to make the product. Basically, what you're looking at here is your... Um, you're looking at your starter for everything that you're dealing with here. So these are very valuable products, these sales. Uh, the first stage of a bioprocess manufacturing operation is to grow a small sample from the cell bank to the volume required to inoculate a production bioreactor, which might hold tens or hundreds of thousands of liters. This stage of a bioprocess manufacturing operation might include the following steps. Number one, take a sample from the cell bank, which we see up here at the top, and then use it to inoculate medium in a petri dish. Recall that each colony starts from a single cell. So each of these dots is a colony of hundreds, thousands, millions of cells. And each one comes starting from a single one cell. Pick a colony, grow a small culture. Then test the culture to make sure the cells are growing well and that they produce the desired product and that they are not contaminated by other microbes. Use this culture to then inoculate a larger flask and use it to grow a still larger culture and use it to continue growing an even larger culture. Some of these cultures may be grown in small bioreactors. Once we've done that, the result of the above steps is a final culture, which is called the seed culture or seed batch. This is large enough to inoculate the main production bioreactor, in which case we can then have the entire process begin to uh, form. We can actually start to grow cells on a large basis. Page 42, feeding cells. So one of your most important jobs will be feeding them. Just like people, cells need a balanced diet to provide them with energy and the materials that they need to make all their molecules. Remember, food is not just energy. It's also the uh, building materials that you use to build new cells, um, repair cells, etc. Uh, you can provide this diet using a growth medium that you'll make. Think of the growth medium as broth or soup. Some of the ingredients in the growth medium will be just what the cells want and can use immediately. Other ingredients will not be in a form the cells can use right away. The cell must break those ingredients down to their building block elements and then reassemble them into all the different proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, and other molecules that cells need to grow and multiply. This process is called metabolism. So what is metabolism? It's the process in which cells break down ingredients in the growth medium, release energy, and reassemble elements into other molecules. On page 43, so what's for dinner? What do cells need? Cells need lots of different elements in order to grow. They need carbon. They need, because remember, organic molecules are carbon-based molecules, and most, um, most of the molecules in your body have carbon as a central core. So if you're going to make more of those uh, molecules, you need more carbon. You're also going to need a lot of hydrogen. You're going to need some oxygen, some nitrogen, some phosphorus, some sulfur, some other elements, and then other additives as well, like amino acids and things like that. Um, they do have a little box here on the middle of page 43. Uh, fast food or expensive restaurant. It says some bacteria and fungi grow on very large scale. They can be fed cheaply on glucose syrup, liquid ammonia, a few salts, and very little else. Other cells like mammalian cells are very picky eaters. They need a very complex mixture of salts and organic compounds as well as glucose. So depending on what type of cell you're growing, you may need it to feed it a little bit differently. However, it's worth talking, talking about carbon. You definitely need to read this last paragraph on page 43. Uh, carbon is a part of almost every cell molecule. Therefore, all growth medium must contain a source of carbon. You have to have a carbon source. Carbon-containing compounds provide the chemical energy that cells need to function. 
glucose is often the primary energy source and carbon source provided to cells. They don't say that there, but it is true. Glucose is your primary energy source. It's also a good source of carbon. However, sometimes more complex carbohydrates such as starches or other sugars get used and cells must break them down into glucose molecules. Flip over to page 44. Nitrogen. You need to know your sources of nitrogen and your sources of nitrogen are going to vary as to whether you're dealing with a bacterial cell or a mammalian cell. Many cells can get the nitrogen they need to make it from all, um, in order to make amino acids, you have to have nitrogen. And ammonia is an excellent source of nitrogen. Ammonia is uh, often supplied as a gas bubbled through the medium. However, you're not going to see that often used with mammalian cells. Instead, you're probably going to use ammonium, which is a type of salt. So ammonium is going to be involved with some salts like ammonium chloride. Oxygen and nitrogen, um, we get oxygen and hydrogen both from air and water. Also from carbon and nitrogen sources as well. They contain some oxygen and hydrogen atoms as well. Um, some cells can grow without oxygen, and those cells are called anaerobes. But others have to have oxygen. They must have oxygen to grow, and they are called aerobes. We're aerobic. Um, aerobic um, exercise refers to needing oxygen. Um, and still others like yeast can grow either with or without oxygen, such as in wine making or bread making. They don't care either way. Uh, phosphorus and sulfur are required. They're usually provided by salts, uh, phosphates and sulfates and such. Cells also require sodium, potassium, and magnesium salts. Other metals such as zinc, iron, and manganese, not magnesium, are needed in very small amounts. They're called trace elements. Last but not least, we have additives. Sometimes cells cannot make all the biomolecules they need. Sometimes we can't make the basic things we need. We have to get it from somewhere else, such as vitamins or other specific organic compounds. Such additives are often called growth factors. Notice last sentence. Other additives, such as antibiotics and antifungal agents, may be used to help prevent the growth of contaminate microorganisms. So sometimes we're trying to keep our cell cultures very pure and only produce a particular type of cell. Um, in order to help keep that so, we can use um, antibiotics and antifungal agents to help prevent the growth of those things. On page 45, they're talking about uh, soup of the day, examples of industrial media recipes. Um, you can notice that for like a... Notice one of the big things here um, that we can tell is the top is a microbe cell culture. The bottom part is a mammalian cell culture. Which of those is more complex? The mammals, obviously. Mammals are more complex beings, so their cells, likewise, are more complex needy as well. Um, notice they both have, they have glucose, uh, metric ton of ammonium sulfate, potassium and sodium salts, protein hydros hydrolysates, excuse me, uh, sorted growth factors, water up to a final volume. But please know this last sentence, please know this, ammonia gas supplies additional nitrogen. It also controls pH, because if you remember, ammonia is a base. So not only is ammonia important for, control and for per contributing nitrogen, it gives us a source of nitrogen atoms. It also helps us control the pH of the solution as well. So ammonia is really important stuff, folks. Please know that information. But notice uh, mammal cells are much more complex. We may have to add amino acids, some soy protein hydrolysate solutions, some different salts, some trace elements, some other growth factors, a little bit of sodium hydroxide for pH adjustment because we won't use ammonia for normal cells, methotrexate to select for the production strain, as well as some glucose, some amino acids, some potassium phosphate, some trace elements, just a lot of stuff going on there. Okay. On page 46, um, differences in media, there is a chart here that is very, very helpful. And I wish that they gave me this chart, but they do not. Um, microbes can, are very large. We can, we can grow enormous quantities of them at a time. Whereas mammal cells, we don't want the bioreactors to be nearly as large. Notice that a microbes are anywhere from 60 to 100,000 liters or so. 
whereas mammal cells are only about 10 to 15,000, 20,000, excuse me. Notice the primary carbon source for both is glucose. Primary nitrogen source for microbes can be liquid ammonia, ammonia salts, protein hydrolysate, whereas for mammals it's going to be your amino acids or protein hydrolysate. Additives for microbes are usually few. Mammals, lots and lots. DI water is good enough for microbes, but we got to use WFI for mammal cells. We sterilize microbes with steam or flow through sterilization. Mammal cells have to be filtered. They're much more delicate. Notice as well it says pH matters. Some of the salts that are added to growth medium, such as sodium phosphate or carbonate salts, can actually act as a buffer and help control the pH of the media. On page 47, guidelines and cautions for making growth media. We're not going to read through this terribly long, but it says use the right stuff. Check your labels. Make sure you're putting the right things in in the right proportions. Number two, very important, follow the SOP exactly. Always follow the SOP. Do not change it. Do not mix it up. Follow the SOP. Number three, always double check your measurements, double check them again, and check double check your procedures. If you have to be double checked and signed off, get somebody to do it. Do it immediately. Do not wait till lunch. Do not wait till later. Number four, check that mixtures are right after they are made. The SOP may call for a measurement of pH, conductivity, or other factors to check that the media components are at the correct concentration. Do not skip any of your checks. Also, use your own eyes and nose to check the medium looks and smells like it should. When you add solid ingredients to water, make sure they all get down into the mixing tank and become completely dissolved. And last, keep your media prep area clean. Keep it clean. On the next page, it says caution is to remember about growth media. Carbon, when media contains carbohydrates, is heat sterilized. Remember, most of your carbon sources are usually a sugar. What happens when you heat up sugar? It caramelizes. So you want to be very careful about that. So you don't want to heat a carbon source too long because sugars can caramelize and turn brown. And when they do that, that's actually kind of toxic stuff that they're forming. So you don't want that to happen. Nitrogen, usually ammonia is a big source for nitrogens. Ammonia is also a base. It's a pretty strong base, actually. So it does have a strong effect on the pH. So do be mindful of that. Also, nitrogen sources such as crude animal or vegetable protein meals or powders may contain high levels of potentially contaminated microorganisms. Other elements as well, certain salts can be heated together to sterilization temperature. They can cause a precipitate to form. And then additives um, are sensitive to heat. They may have to be um, sterilized in very specific ways and perhaps separately before they're added in. On page 49, there is a lab about making media in a lab. I always skip this lab because, honestly, it's a complex lab. And the whole point of it is to show you that making media can be a complex thing. To me, that's a little redundant and seems like a waste of materials. So we're not going to worry about that but too terribly much. Um, on page 54, we have some key concepts in making media. And this basically sums up the lab that we're going to skip out on doing here. Mistakes in mixing the recipe will cause problems with the product. The order of added ingredients can be critical because like we were talking about, carbon sources can caramelize, etc. The order of add, um, all media must get down into the tank and get mixed up. You have to use your eyes and nose to check the finished mixture. Keep your media prep areas clean. Big theme in this course, all the way from the unit, the first few units, follow the SOP exactly. Follow the SOP exactly. Always be consistent and have a coworker double check your measurements. Page 55 through 57 ish, 59, excuse me. Uh, let's talk about that really quick and then we'll be done with this little section. Overall media mixing systems, uh, mixing media on an industrial scale. Um, it's a complicated process, and it depends a lot on how your system is going to work. Um, in this case, uh, the figure that follows illustrates typical components of the media mixing system. For example, 
Um, you're, and you, you're going to have several sources of, in, of ingredients. It says, for example, liquid media components such as sugar solutions could come from tanks or drums. Water for the media comes from the appropriate plant system, either WFI, USP water, which if you remember is pretty, uh, USP water is actually pretty high quality water. It's just not guaranteed pyrogen free. Uh, simply deionized water sometimes is good enough. Uh, dry media ingredients in very large amounts may come from silos and other dry media ingredients supplied in drums or bags. Now this section is important because of this last little section at the bottom of page 55. You need to know this part under page 55. Ingredient amounts can usually automatically be measured by weight. We can do it by load sales, which are measured under the tank that measures how heavy the tank is. We can do it by level sensors that measure the inside of the tank. So we can indicate where ingredient reaches a certain level. Or we can do it by flow measuring instruments, which are mounted in the supply lines. So we can either do it under the tank, in the tank, or in the supply lines. Um, and we do that by load sales, level sensors, and flow measuring instruments. And you do need to know those situations here. On page 57, sterilizing the growth media. Uh, whenever the mixture, the growth media must be sterile, free of live microorganisms before it can be given to the cells you want to grow. So we do have to sterilize it. Remember that there are lots of microorganisms in an environment. You don't want to give them a free lunch, so you must start with a sterile medium and then add the production cells to start growth. You can think of it as one of the things you do for a farmer is they retail their land every year before they um, get ready to plant vegetables or their crop, whatever that may be. And they, part of the reason for tilling the land is not just to mix up the nutrients, but it's also to get rid of anything that may already be growing in that space because you don't want these weeds and things to grow. You only want your product to grow. So in batch sterilization, steam passes through the jacket of the tank until the contents are heated throughout to the sterilization temperature. The medium ingredients experience a long period of heat while the temperature builds up to sterilization temperature. This temperature remains for a set time. It gets cut off. The temperature lowers. The tank cools back down. Batch sterilization is not used in large-scale fermentation operations. Volumes in these operations can be tens of thousands of liters. Sterilizing such a large volume at one time would require heating for such a long period that the components of the growth mean would probably break down and form precipitates. So instead, we use flow-through sterilization. Flow-through sterilization is down here. Let's zoom in on that picture. That's right there. See? Notice this right here, this little section, heat exchanger, heat exchanger. Bam. Here we go. Heat exchangers. Okay? Flow-through sterilization. You need to know this. This is a way of sterilizing growth media. Flow-through sterilization. So what happens here is the media mixing tank pumps the media in here. The preheater starts to heat it up. Okay, so it starts to absorb heat from this pipeline that's passing near it. Basically, the heat gets passed off from this over to the media. So the preheater kind of warms it up, and then it comes over to the actual heater, and the heater heats this up. This has a steam seal based around it, which we can use to help sterilize the heater as needed. So we start to heat this stuff up, and then we have retention tubes, long extra lines to keep this here, and because we do want to cool it off once it's heated up. Remember, the whole purpose of heating it up is to sterilize it. So we have these long tubes afterwards to give it room to cool off, and any residual heat that they may have, we actually use it in the preheater to pass off to the in next incoming uh, media, and so we can help stabilize that and sterilize it, rather. On page 58, they explain this step by step, probably a little bit better than I just did. Um, but remember, uh, remember, as a process technician, your tasks include inspecting the media in the tanks, sampling the media in the tanks, and keeping track of different batches and recipes. Uh, we're going to stop right there uh, with how we do media prep.